<coughs> Brother Jerry put some of these on the YouTube. Brother, and he's doing the DVD still, but he was out. He put some of these on YouTube. So, just as a caution to you, if you've got a question or comment or something, don't use personal names. Because those things are being seen by everybody everywhere. So, comment, that's fine. Question, fine. But let's try to refrain from using any personal names because uh, a lot of things get crosswise out there. Another thing is, uh, if you're in these studies, the best thing to do is have you a pencil and paper, even if it's just a short note, because I'm going to fire some scriptures today quickly, and uh, I'll give them to you twice, but then I'm going to go on and read them, so you may not have a chance to, to find them as fast as I do, and uh, so if you write them down, you will have to go back and look at them later. We're going to start with Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, and uh, uh, that's basically going to be where we're, uh, well, we're just going to use that as basically a topic scripture today. And most of you know what that verse says, and I'm going to read it here for it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. <clears throat> now, it's not by grace alone, and there's a reason for that. God's grace saves us, but it's not His grace alone. Think about that for a moment because there's another part of that verse that says it's uh, you're saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. If it was strictly by grace that we were saved, you wouldn't have to do nothing and, and it would make a great big question mark out here in the world that's called inclusive <coughs> There's many ministers that have left good, solid, biblical teaching. Uh, we know of a particular minister in Tulsa, Oklahoma that had a huge church, had some very well-known people go to that church. He fell into this. He was a graduate of ORU, uh, had degrees. The man got hung up on this inclusive salvation. Of course, he got hung up on some other things. As a result, he wound up without a church. Nobody would let him preach. He thought all of his friends had left him. They tried to, to major ministers out there, tried to go back and convince him. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. He believes that every sinner is going to heaven. He does not believe in hell. Yeah. How you can go through and be teach all this other stuff all those years and fall into that, but I'm just telling you, that's what I want you to get out of this. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And being, we're talking about faith, that's what we want to center on. Because if it was only by grace, then everybody would be saved and we could just go home and party and have a good time, do whatever you wanted. wouldn't make any difference. All right? Titus 2.11, I'm not going to read that for you. That's one you need to write down and look at later. God's grace has come to all men. That's what that says. And it has. We're in the age of grace. We are in a period to where God favors us. If he didn't, if it wasn't grace, you couldn't get saved. Period. But it's not by grace alone. There's faith involved. And what we want to understand is where did that faith come from? How do I get it? That's what we want to understand. Is it the same faith that I use for healing? Is it the same faith I use for uh, my needs being met? Is, is that what we're talking about? Well, what did Jesus say in Luke 18, 8 when he said, when I come back, will I find faith? That's what, that's, is he talking about the same thing? And, and what's he talking about? And that's what we're going to look at. So we have to, to put faith in with this grace. Basically, mixed faith works. You can't be saved without faith. You've got to have faith. We're in an age where you can be saved because God has put grace on it where you can, but you've got to have faith mixed with it. So where do we get the faith? Well, the Bible says here, in fact, in, in Ephesians 2.8 that we just read, it's a gift of God. It's given to us as a gift. God not only gave us grace, grace the period here where we could be saved without works, lest any man should boast, but then he said, but you've got to have faith 
Indians, you probably ain't got it yourself. I'm going to give you some faith. Now, we get the faith by hearing his word. It's preached. When, when we hear the message of the gospel, the gospel of salvation, we get faith through that hearing of that. Now, we have to act on it. It doesn't make you automatically saved just because you heard the gospel of grace or the gospel of salvation. It doesn't, doesn't mean you're automatically saved. You could go to church all your life and hear that same message and not be saved. Because there's a part that we have to do our own self. We have to reach out and receive that and take it in. And then God, in that process, there's so much that happens at that moment of salvation. Number one, it says we don't even get there unless the Holy Spirit draws us. So we've got the Holy Spirit working to draw us, convict us of our sins so that we can receive that gospel message. God gives you a measure of faith that you can open up and receive it, and, and therefore, you've got salvation. That's what takes place all at the beginning, all in just, I don't know, split second or whatever you want, or however you want to look at it, but that's what takes place at salvation. Now, human faith, this is the God kind of faith. God gives you His faith. We already had faith, but it's human faith. And human faith is this. You see that chair over there, I believe I can see it. I can walk over and feel it so I know it's there. And it looks sturdy enough and I trust and believe that it'll hold me so I can go sit down on it and rest in it. All right, that's human faith. But it all comes from these senses. Uh, and God gave us these senses from the physical body to be able to contact this physical world that we're in so that we don't get burnt. So that we eat when properly, you know, if, if you didn't have the, 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 that in your system, if somehow that particular part of you gets messed up, you would ne you'd never get hungry. You'd just sit around and starve absolutely to death. Yeah, I know, most of us do. <laughs> we don't have that problem. <laughs> but anorexic people run into that condition. They go to a point to where they break over. And therefore, they're not even hungry anymore. They don't even eat. Yeah, and they're totally, their whole mind's messed up. And this mind is so unique that God gives us. You know, when you go into the dentist's office, first thing I tell them is, I don't care how much it costs, I want the gas. Give me the gas. I want that because I don't want to leave here laughing about the whole situation, whether I can afford it or not. Just give it to me. All right? But what that gas is, is a mind-altering drug. It confuses your mind to where the pain you think is fun. So you're just laughing. They don't make any difference what they do. They're pulling your whole jawbone out of your body, and you're laughing about it and don't really care, you know? No, I, I, it's wonderful. I mean, that's the only way I'm going to have my teeth come out of my body. That's it. Unless God takes them out supernaturally. <laughs> I'd love to have that portion of it. That'd even be better. <clears throat> but but those, that's human faith. We have some of that. We can trust in that. But it's only in the natural realm. And what we're talking about here, this God kind of faith, is totally beyond the senses. It, it blows our mind. It's, it's supernatural. It's something that, you know, our body says you can't, but your spirit says you can. So, so we have to... And when we're renewing the mind, this is what we're renewing. We're renewing something that's dependent upon these senses all this time. And now we have to look at it and say, I know in the natural that ain't, won't work, can't work. There's no possible way. But God's word says it can, and that's what I depend on. And that's where we have to get at in this healing faith. All right? But we want to understand this faith just a little bit because if we can understand saving faith and get that down in us, then it's easier for us to begin to understand healing faith, how to, to appropriate healing through that same faith. Uh, Romans 4.17 says that God's faith goes beyond the senses. And we know that. We know that it goes beyond this natural. Saving faith does the same thing because why? You don't see God. I don't know what you saw when you come to the altar, but I saw nothing but the flames of hell is what I saw, and I didn't want to go there. Why? Because that's the message, that's the gospel message I got. 
you either get saved and receive him now, or if you die, that's where you're going to go. That's, that was the message that I got. Well, when I came to that altar, that's what I saw. I mean, I saw it so vividly I could smell the smoke. I didn't want no part of it. And I, I just poured myself out right there at the altar. I said, Lord, save me. I repent of whatever I've ever done or could do or possibly will do. Save me. I want to be saved. And, and so that was salvation faith for me. Uh, but it, it goes beyond our natural realm. Because the ordinary person out on the street that's never heard the gospel <coughs> really could care less about heaven and heaven. They don't know about it. They have some understanding that there's a higher creation, and the more intellectual they get, the more they understand something here had to do it, but they don't put it all together, and they don't always accept it. The more educated they get, the more dumber that they get in that area, it seems like sometimes. So where do we get it? Romans 10, 17 says this now. We know what that says. That faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, how did it come? Did it come by my picking this up and reading it? Well, how did salvation come? How did, how did I get faith for salvation? I may have not even read anything. I was a 13-year-old and don't even think I had a Bible at the time, to be honest with you. But the message that I heard that day was from a long East Texas, Louisiana uh, preacher that had fingers about that long. And he's pointing right at me, seemed like and telling me I was going to hell. That's, that's the gospel. That's what I heard. And that's what I based my need on. Of course, I know now that the Holy Spirit was in here tugging at me, telling me, you need to respond to the message that you heard. And so I did. I come out of there and came down to the altar and poured myself out to it. All right? I surrendered. I did my part of it. I surrendered. When I come down then, God not only because of his grace I was able to do that, but now he's given me a measure of faith to receive that supernaturally because I see nothing to believe on. That preacher could have been lying to me. I, I don't know that. I, I, I accept it by faith is what I did. There was not a picture that I could look at other than the one I had in my mind, and that's all I could see was flames of, of hell and smell of smoke. It looked surreal, but... That's all supernatural. That's not in my natural system. So that's where my faith came from, was from something supernatural. And what the Bible says is that God gave me a measure of faith at that moment to be able to receive. Now, that's basically probably where we stopped at last week, and the reason that I wanted to get there was that's where we want to pick up because that's the clue to really understand is where do you get your faith did we all get the same faith? Did God use a different measuring spoon for Kevin than he did for me? Did he get more or did he get less or, or how did we get it? Can I do something with the measure that he gave me? Those are questions that we have and no questions that we need to answer. Okay? And we're going to answer those through Scripture. Uh... Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now, I'm going to read a bunch of little short pieces of Scripture here, so bear with me. But I want to read these. 5, 22 and 23, and, and you'll these will come back and shake your memory as I read them, because you've heard them before. It says in this, but the fruit of the Spirit. All right, the fruit of what Spirit? My Spirit? No, the Holy Spirit. But this is the fruit inside of me, that comes at salvation when the Holy Spirit moves in, he comes in and he has this fruit. Now he wants to rearrange the furniture in me because he wants this fruit to come out. The same fruit he has because it's the same, it's the God kind of fruit. It's fruit that the Father has and that Jesus has. So that's the fruit that he wants me to portray being I'm saved. All right? So here's what it is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. There it is. Faith. It's a part of that. Meekness, temperance against such, there is no law. So that faith is in there. It's involved in that. So that, that I got, when I got it, when I got saved, I got the Holy Spirit, 
and that fruit is in there. Now that doesn't mean I jumped up and immediately portrayed all this fruit. Why? Because this mind hasn't got renewed yet. And this body is only going to respond to what this brain here tells it. So if I'm still operating underneath fleshly senses, when I got saved, I'm going to jump up. Now, I may express emotions. Remember, the soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. My will surrendered. I came down. My mind has not been renewed. My emotions are underneath my control, but I may weep, I may laugh, I may, however you, God moved you at the moment, or, or your body moved, expression-wise, all right? But the fruit, the Holy Spirit's now on the inside of you. So all of this fruit is available to you, but it's going to take you time, and as you begin then to read the Word, study the Word, sit under the Word, and depending on how fast we grab a hold of it, God is going to move this fruit from the inside to where it begins to operate on the outside, through the flesh. And people are going to see, well, I'll give you an example, somebody that's had a, a violent temper and they get saved, it may take a while for that violent temper, but over a period of time, God is going to temper that temper. And pretty soon you're going to see some gentleness and meekness and love and faith begin to come out of that. And like I say, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens at different times for different people depending on who they are and, and, and also as to how long they've been underneath this thing and how much of this word that they actually get a hold of and study and, and begin to understand. And let me say one more thing, Howard, and I'll get back to you on your on your quick question. All right, because I want to make sure we get this in right at this moment. This this understanding. When we read this, we're reading and we're getting knowledge. All right? The more of it you can get in here, the more knowledge that we have to operate on. But what we're talking about here is understanding. You can have a pile of knowledge and not have the understanding. You can sit in the class for weeks and weeks and months and years learning how to drive a car, but until you get behind the wheel, you ain't going to be operating on it. You see what I'm saying? That's where the understanding comes in. Right? Now you're behind the wheel. It's, it's reality. It's real to you. And it's the same way here. Many, many, many church people are cram jam full of knowledge but no understanding because they haven't put it to work. They haven't got behind the wheel. And a lot of them don't get behind the wheel because of this. They'll have somebody. Now, this is, let's look at Paul and Timothy in Scripture. Paul had the revelation. Timothy was getting the knowledge. But Paul didn't want to leave Timothy with just a pile of knowledge. So Paul brings Timothy up and trains him up and then he puts a church here and he says, now Timothy, you're in charge of that and you operate under the anointing because we laid hands on you and prayed for you. He said, your, your grandma Eunice has prayed for you. All these people's prayed for you. You've got it. Now you've got to operate in it. Do you think he had 100% understanding of how to pastor a church when he started? Absolutely <laughs> not. I'll guarantee you. No, he didn't. But he had to stick and put his foot in and get in there so that he was able to put it to work. Because until faith is put to work, it'll never do nothing. It's dead, just like James said. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't contradicting Paul. All he was saying was, yeah, Paul's true in that area, all right. But even Paul knows that you got to take this faith that you got and you got to work on it yourself. And, and, and many people, I'm not criticizing uh, prayer lines because, listen, I used to have a prayer line every Sunday night in our church that we pastored. Why? Because I knew there was pe people in the church that that was the only place their faith was at. They couldn't get healed any other way. And until they progressed in their understanding to where they could get it on their own, then they needed measure. Now, what I want to emphasize is this. 
he didn't give me any different measuring cup <clears throat> than he gave anybody else. All right? We all got the same measure. It depends on how I work my measure, but I can't work my measure until I understand it. How can I operate something I can't drive an 18 wheeler that I don't know how? I don't have no understanding of how to drive that. Sure, I can drive a Volkswagen. That's pretty easy. But when I step behind that 18 wheeler, there's a whole lot of different circumstances involved there. I know, there's some driving 18 wheelers that probably need to be in a Volkswagen. <laughs> and vice versa. Let's put it that way. All right. But yeah, I, I learned a, a, a whole lot about that just going with Kenny on the road. I couldn't hop behind one of those things and, and move it down the road, especially trying to bag it up. I'd be stuck out in one of them cornfields over there in the wind turbine area. I'll tell you right now. Stuck, really stuck. So, But God used one measure, and we all got the same. If, if the church could, could come away with that idea and understand that and look at everybody that's born again in that church, We've all, we all got the same measure. I'm not greater than anybody else. God's now gifts are different, but faith is a gift also. All right? An anointing. There's anointing. Yes, God will anoint you. What, what gift is, is the, the most important in the church? It's the one that's needed at the time. You don't need a yeah, gift yeah. of teaching if everybody's sick and dying. You need a gift of healing to operate there. I get up and teach all I want. It's not going to do nothing for none of them. You need a gift of healing at that moment. Now, if everybody's well, then that's fine. We've come to an understanding and we've been able to accept healing and therefore maybe a little more teaching will help us along, give us some understanding. Then, then that's what we need. All right? So that, that is one area. God used one measure. We all got the same. Another verse going along with that one, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. Like I say, I'm going to jump around just a little bit, but just bear with me. But 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. If you can't find them that quick, just write them down. It says, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 says, and here again, Paul, in his thanksgiving, uh, in prayer, he's talking here again to born-again people, to the Thessalonians, says, we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren. Talking about him praying and his group praying for them. As it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And he's thought, talking to the Thessalonians here, and he says, your faith groweth exceedingly. So by that we could understand that our faith can grow. All right? Our faith can grow. We can grow that faith. God gives you a measure to get started. It's almost like, and I, and I hate to use this word because yeast in bread is always considered evil. But it's like the yeast in the bread. You put a little bit of yeast in there and set that pile of dough out here and it's just going to blow up and get bigger and bigger and bigger. All right? It's how much yeast you put in it. But God only put one measure. He put the right measure. You don't need any more. <laughs> yeah, you won't get puffed up. That's for sure. <laughs> All right? But we got just the right measure is what we got. And he says, basically, that's all you need. You got all you need. You can't pray for faith because you can't get faith by prayer. It says, faith cometh by hearing. You see? You can sit in here and pray all day for God to give you faith. And God's probably sitting up there doing this and wondering, man, when are they ever going to give up and get it? Because you ain't getting no more faith. And I'm give you the measure that that's all you need. Now, stop and think about this. If God gave everybody the same measure, how much did Paul and those guys get? Same measure. Same measure. In fact, we could go as far to say, and we'll look in the scripture and see it, but you got the same measure that Jesus got for what he did. Oh boy, that's tough. We're going to have to think on that. How it's going to we got the same measure he got, and he did what? Oh boy, that's that's tough. We're going to have to deal with that one there, ain't we? Well, let me stop for just a moment before we go any further with that, because I want you to look at, at something in Galatians 5, 6, and you'll remember this. I'm not going to read the whole verse. 
Faith worketh by what? Love. Love. All right? Now, what does that tell you? <coughs> it means if your faith's not working, that's probably the first area we need to check. Unforgiveness will absolutely make your faith not work. <coughs> if your faith's not working, what's your prayers going to do? Right back. Absolutely nothing. You're going to have to go back and get started right back where those two are connected together at. Faith and love. Yes. I'm going to give you three scriptures. Write these down and come up later. Because 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says this, Breastplate of faith and love. Connects the two together. Alright? Paul is using the same thing he used in Ephesians 6 when he was talking about the armor. And he calls it here the breastplate of faith and love. <clears throat> a breastplate of faith ain't going to do you no good if you don't have the love. A breastplate of love ain't going to do you no good if you're not working the faith. You see what, what we're looking at? 1 Timothy 6 11 says this godliness, faith, and love. There again, faith and love. When the love goes out of the church, when Paul criticized these and when Jesus talked to them over here to the, the seven churches of Revelation, the first thing that he mentions in here about them is this, even the lukewarm churches that may have been hot at one time, there's something that happened. Paul calls it, any time that there's strife and confusion in a church, then there's something wrong. There's the love has moved aside and something else has moved in. And so any time that uh, we could say this, any time that we pray and we don't see results happening in our prayers, the first thing that we need to do is check our love factor. Because we got the measure of faith. You ain't <coughs> just checking your faith. You got to measure it when you got faith. It should be there working. It don't leave us. All right? We may not have grown it as much as we would like to, but it's there. It will operate if we got love. But if we've got unforgiveness, bitterness, uh, anger, strife, any of that stuff, love is not. Love has been moved aside, and the prayers aren't going to work. And this is why it's so cut and big and critical in the family life to make sure that you get those things out of the way and get them cleared up quick. That's why Jesus said immediately. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. He didn't say it was that wrong to have wrath. <clears throat> go ahead and inhabit. Kick the can. Get it out of the way and, and move on. But uh, get on get on your knees and get forgiveness of all that. You know, move it out. Yes, Judy. Uh, speaking of faith, I mean, I think this is my faith. Um, <clears throat> I was down to $10 and Bill was down to about $5. Well, yesterday in the mail, we got a check for $7. And that is, that is God's grace. Yes. Yeah. And, and any need that we have, any need, and we know we got it. Now, scripturally, I believe this because Jesus showed it to me a long time ago, God did, is the fact that I never run up against the need that he hasn't already provided for. All right? Now, I may not be able to see it, so it's going to be a supernatural provision in the first place. But uh, involved in that, I have to believe and do something my own self. Be patient, wait in that and in love. Yes, Richard? Yes? I'll believe with you. <laughs> okay? All right. When, whenever you get it, come back and let us know, or we'll praise God with you. I believe that I believe that's the need. <coughs> yes. It doesn't work. You're the prime example. I'm gonna use you as a prime example. Alright? Because you got your feelings hurt up here. And you had a right to have your feelings hurt. That's okay. Go kick the can. Get rid of it. I know you from the past. I've known you now, so I'm around you enough to know. Let him go. Don't fill with him. Give him some rope and let him go out here. All right? We prayed for you, and, and we got in touch with you to find out what the problem was immediately. <coughs> we knew that. We didn't <coughs> discourage you. We didn't encourage you other than the fact to tell you that our door is open all the time and we love you. All right? So you called and you came. 
and we sat down and talked. Wanda and Abby did more for you than I did. Now, I did share my example of what had happened to me and me and my dad, but, but Abby and Wanda basically opened the door up here that went to his heart and got him, and, and then you called the pastor, and the two of you had a good conversation, and therefore, <coughs> what was it? It was all, everything's fine. That's See, that's where the church is, that's what the church is supposed to do. That's how it's supposed to operate. It's not that we're never going to get our feelings hurt. We're human beings, and we're still in this being body. Right. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'll get to you there. Just a minute. Let me get to you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Junior. something there because not every church operates in the love that you need in order to move what you need to move. In other to, to raise your yeast level, get your faith faith up as we're talking about. And if you're in a church that they're just constantly bickering back and forth and, and I don't care if it's Sunday school this church or outside or where it's at, if they're in a constant bickering how in the world are you going to keep your love, your faith? You guys, it's going to be a struggle for you. But when you come into a church that's got the love flowing in it and operating in it, it's a whole lot easier for your love to get up here. And, and look at this. If we look at that Galatians 5, 6 and say that faith worketh by love, then the more love we've got, the more faith we've got. Less love, less faith. More faith, more prayers answered. Less faith, less prayers answered. So the more love, the more faith, the more prayers that get answered, the more this thing revolves around, the better relationship that we got, better fellowship that you got, the whole thing runs smooth as a result. I, I just want to say, you know, that's why this church body is powerful. Because it's not just the love of That's our motto. That's our motto. That's it. Attacks that sure. He, sure. That's the only way he can get in. Absolutely. And he is after this church because this church is fixed to make a mark on this community. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I feel that all yeah. over my body. Yeah. And, and the reason for that, again, goes right back to this love. Where can God work? Yes. It says, Faith worketh by love. And if God's going to move in and help your faith, He's going to move in and help it because you got love. And when the strife gets in, God is not going to, he's not going to batter against that. He's going to step back until we finally say, yeah, something must be wrong. Something, somewhere, is not working. And the best place that we can look is in the mirror at ourselves and find out, have I got, is it me? Is it me, Lord, that need a prayer? And I'm proud of Howard because he was open. Because he's grown. I mean, he was open. It's, it's, you know, he's not I want to emphasize that because he's grown. He's grown immensely since he's been here. Since we first met Howard, we've seen growth in Howard. But I've seen growth from this church since you since we moved into this church. There's there's growth. There's spiritual growth. It didn't come overnight.
There's a void. In the there's a, there's a flip side. There's always a flip side. So I want to give you just a glimpse because we know where we're at now. But let's just let's roll the stone back a little bit and look at something else. Let's just suppose Howard just blowed up and went out here and uh, told half the community he is associated with how sorry the church we were and all this. All right. And suppose that we didn't, we, we just told him, you know, or he wanted to come back, and we said, no, we, we, don't, we don't want you back here. Yeah, we don't need you. You're not needed here. <coughs> Do you think God would open up and bless this church? No. No way. Absolutely. No way. So what we did involved in that. Now, Satan, what Satan tried to do, he tried to take a wedge and, and he found a little crack and he poked the wedge in and tried to make it worse. And what we did was kick the wedge out and pull it back together. And as a result, God can bless and will bless. And he'll bless everybody as a result of one little thing. Yeah. 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 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and Peter here it says, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, we know that, we know who Peter is, to them he's talking to them that have obtained like precious faith, so he's talking to you and I, what does he mean, like precious faith those that got the same measure I did is what he's talking about, that like precious faith means of equal value and equal honor, so what Paul or Peter saying here I'm not above you because I'm an apostle. He says, I'm one that's of like precious faith. You got the same thing I did when you got saved. There's not going to be no greats and littles in heaven. They're all going to be the same. And that's the way God intended it here in the church. Now, there's church order. You can't have a hundred heads in the church. That'd be a freak. We only got one head in the church, and that's who God appointed over is the pastor, Kevin.
There were some people that had problems with it in Jesus' day. Yeah, I thought I'd be right. I brought that up in front of the pastor, and I thought I'd be right. Well, he took me down real quick. He brought your office back. Amen. We don't, we don't, it's hard for us because we're still in a human body to understand the love of God, agape love. We grow and we grow and we grow and we'll grow all of our human life. We'll never be able to totally touch God's love and understand it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. In uh, Galatians 2.20, uh, that's another one. If you just want to mark it, that's fine. Galatians 2.20, I'm going to read it. It says, I am, and this was Paul here talking. <coughs> he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. All right, he's giving a contrast here. He says, I'm crucified with him. When, when they, in other words, when they crucified Christ on the cross, I'm crucified with him, but I live. But then again, he says, but not I. But it's Jesus that lives in me. Now, the natural mind can't understand that. Only a spiritual mind can understand that. Because it's the same thing, same testimony you and I have. I live, I live in this flesh on the same Roy that where I grew up at, not any difference there, same old body, but yet I don't live. Because it's Christ that lives in me. And then he goes on to say, in the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Where did he get that? He, you can't get it unless you got it from the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is saying this very thing in that verse. He's saying he had the same kind of faith that Jesus had. Otherwise he couldn't say I was crucified with him. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I but Christ liveth in me. I've got the same faith that Jesus had. If Paul could say that. Peter could say that. Then you and I can say that. We all got the same measure. Now. Jesus even talked to his disciples, you know, he, he accredited them with faith, something of understanding what faith was, in which I'm going to give you a definition here in a minute, my definition of what I see as faith is, but God used this same measure in every one. He told some in the scripture that they had little faith, some he said they have no faith, some had little faith, some had great faith. And of all things, Kevin, Cornelius, that old heathen Gentile, he said, I've never seen such great faith as this man's got in all of Israel. And they went to church every day and knew the scriptures backwards and forwards and, you know, lived it and, and all of that. But he says, I've never seen such great faith as that man's got. All right? Now, he hadn't even been, at the time, born again yet. But, but anyhow, uh, go ahead, Caroline.
that I ever felt the love of God and the love for one another and hold one another up. And I had been, I can't, I got, I don't want to miss a day when we have church or nothing. The other churches like going to Sunday or something. But this, I got to be here all the time. And it's the love of God in this church. And that's what holds it up. I want to, I want us to do a confession right quick, all right? Confessions are good for us. That's, that's basically saying something that we should understand by now. We're not totally through with it. We're going to go some more. But I want you to say this. I've got the faith that Jesus has. I've got the love that Jesus has. Now, you really need to keep saying that and keep believing that until you get it down on the inside of you that I've got, I walk around daily and I've got the faith and I've got the love that Jesus has. I've got those working on the inside of me, all right? All I have to do now is work it like Jesus worked it. That's the difficult part, is to walk it out. But we've got it. He gave us the measure of faith. He gave us grace. He's got that. We've got His love. We've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of us greater than anything that's in this world or the world's beyond. We've got that residing on the inside of us. And all we have to do is begin to work it. We can only work it as we understand it. We, we gain more knowledge of it out of His Word. We begin to understand more and more. We'll be able to work it more and more. And the faith will come forth. The love will come forth. And it'll all shine. Now, I want to give you my definition of faith. Here it is. It's an action that's originating and proceeding from a conviction that I have that what I'm doing has approval of God. All right? Now, that's a long, lengthy thing to remember. I don't expect you to remember it. But it's an action. In other words, it's something that shows. It's a manifestation. It's going to be, I, I can't talk about love unless I show my love for people. You know, you can tell right quick whether somebody's telling the truth or not. They can get up in church and testify about love all they want. You know who they are when they get out there. And that's where it proves out is when we walk out these doors. But it's an action that originates and proceeds from a conviction that I have. Where did I get my conviction? I got my conviction from what I studied in the Word, what I see in the Word, what revelation that I've got of, of who God is and what God does. Without an understanding of God, we can't walk in very much. We can't. We, we've got to understand who God is. In fact, uh, in Luke 18.8, uh, I'm going to go there in just a moment, but it's a conviction that what I'm doing, and, and listen if that's true, if what I'm doing has God's approval on it, then every time I stand before you, I better be in faith. I better be believing that what I'm laying out to you has God's approval on it. Because you're not going to be accountable for it. I am. Do you understand that? And it's the same way anything that we say, if we had this inside, if the church had that understanding inside of them, that everything that I do and everything that I say has to have God's approval. We'd either be silent and not doing nothing, <laughs> or we'd be walking in some strong faith. Right. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you what, we'd have to be understanding that what I'm saying and what I'm doing, I believe, I have a conviction in here that what I'm saying and doing has God's approval. All right? And that's faith. That's how you can get up and, and you you can't deliver. How could I deliver a sermon to people knowing that it's something that, yes, I, I put that thing together. Yeah, I had to write some stuff down, all right, and look some stuff up. But I have to believe that what that comes forth, it has God's approval on it. And if it don't have God's approval, I've got no business letting it come out of my lips. You, under, you understand that? That's, that's just critical. That's, that's my talk about faith. But I want to show you one more little thing here before we leave over in Luke 18, 8. And you know this story. It's a parable that Jesus gave. And it says he spoke this parable to them to this end and the reason that men ought always to pray and not to faint. In other words, this parable has to do with praying and not giving up is what it's about. So 
Understand that as we're talking, because that's what Jesus said right there. There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. So he wasn't a just godly judge. This is not God that is talking about here, because God does uh, have regard for man. And there was a widow in that city, and, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, because if I don't, she's just going to keep coming and coming and coming and worry me to death, and I want to get rid of her. That's basically, that's my interpretation. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. Hear what he said. He's an old unjust judge, but he's speaking in wisdom here. And shall not God? Now he's changed it. He said, you heard what the unjust judge, how he handled it. Now, he said, and we're talking about prayer. We're talking about praying, 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 and not giving up on somebody. All right? Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night? Uh, unto him, though he hear along with them, or bear along with them. In verse 8, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, this is the question, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? Isn't that something that he give a parable about prayer? He told what the unjust judge did, and he said, look at the old unjust judge. He lived, he acted in wisdom. He said, if I don't do something, she's going to keep bothering me. And he said, now look at God. But then he broke it off here at the last and says, when the Son of Man cometh, because in the end of this chapter is over here, he's going to be talking about him coming back, will he find faith on earth? He, he pulls it right back to faith again. Will he find faith? And here's the thing about that, what he's saying here. What kind of faith is Jesus going to be looking for when he comes back? That's the question. And I'm going to get you, Junior. I'm going to say two more things here. Here's what kind of faith he's going to be looking for. People who know who God is. People who know who God is. In that verse, a God of just and righteousness. Justice and righteousness. We, we need an understanding of who God is. It, our faith, our love, how we operate in the world is going to reflect on our understanding of who God is. That's the reason we have so much problem with younger people today that don't know their fathers. They don't have an understanding of who a father is. So they have a hard time understanding anything about God and what kind of father he should be. All right? And secondly, he's going to be looking for people who pray without losing heart. How are you going to pray without losing heart unless you understand this love that you've got and you and the faith that you got when you got saved. It all works together. Junior? We were talking about this faith, you know, and it, it, it means, you know, faith is not, I think a lot of people base faith on prayer being answered. They, if on the mount, when Jesus prayed, there were really, you know, Having, here, here's the thing having God's approval all right that's where we come back with that faith deal has it got God's approval how do I know that what I'm praying has God's approval all right I go down to the car show and I see about a 57 blue <coughs> Long wheel bay Chevy pickup with, you know, still got the step side. I used to own one of those years ago. Didn't look near that good. But, I mean, and it was a mud hog. It just pulled through all the bogs. Didn't even have four-wheel drive. Just tell you all that stuff right straight up front. I love that thing. All right. Well, I see that, so I just go home and I, I, I can't even hardly put gas in the one that I got. And I'm going to sit down and, oh, God, thank you, Lord, for that blue truck. Thank you. Oh, I can see it now parked in my garage, God. Sell it down by gas. 
We ain't got a sack of beans in the pantry to eat. And I'm, I'm thanking you, though, Lord, for that blue truck. Because I, I could just see myself driving around Martinsville, telling them, look what God did for me in my blue truck. You understand that? If, is, has God got his approval on it, is what I would have to understand. If God had his approval on it, I'd get the blue truck. <clears throat> but am I totally confident in my understanding that, that God has got his approval on that? Well, that's what I'm saying. Does God have his approval on it? You understand what I'm saying? But anything that I see in this word, anything that I see in here that he says belongs to me as a result of my covenant with him, my relationship with him, his redemption that he's paid for, any of that stuff, it don't, listen, that, that faith, that measure, that's all I need. Because that belongs to me. I don't, it's not a matter anymore of, of asking. It's not a matter of pleading. When you see people pleading and pleading and pleading for something that's written in this word, they don't have an understanding. Their faith's not there yet. It's not going to work for them. It comes to a point to where we know. I know my salvation. I know I'm saved. I don't have to plead with God every morning when I get up for my salvation anymore. I'm saved. You see that? All right. All the other things in here that he says in his word, if he says he's going to meet my needs according to his riches and glory, then I don't have to get up every morning and beg him for that. I get up and thank you, Lord. I thank you all my needs are met. I don't know how you're going to do it. That 50-inch screen's coming to me, Lord. I need that. You understand what I'm saying? Saying there, uh, Junior? It's. <clears throat> yeah. His will is his will is an approved thing for you. And and I have just I I'm not there with anything else out. I don't go, you know, I'm praying for my mom, I'm praying for my dad, I'm praying for I pray I pray for my children and grandkids, but here's how I pray for them. For their eyes and their understanding to be open. Because I know otherwise it's not gonna do them. I don't care if they got a million dollars tomorrow. If the eyes of their understanding is not open. They'll blow through that and be gone right on. It'll never do them any good at all. You right. see? So I, I pray that for my children, that the eyes of their understanding be open. Now, if they're sick, yes, I'll pray for them for, them for their sickness. I want to tie my faith in with theirs. But, but for that, the main prayer I pray for them is that very thing. Lord, open their eyes. Because we're too far down the line here on this thing. They need their eyes open. Wanda, you can close us out. I remember being in church and this lady, her daughter was sick. She had multiple distant three months or whatever. And she told me one time, and I'll never forget it, that she, God kept her that way because uh, that was his will for her to be that way. So because she was a testimony to other people. Pray and we decide to hear Lord, we thank you, Father, that your will. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that your will be done in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the love that does abound in this life of Jesus. And Father, we ask that you just be with us, give us a good day tomorrow, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 By the way, the, the weighty road today has been ethical.